Spain to have that as Nelson Mandela Square. Again, it lost out to Festival Square because it was the 40th anniversary of the festival, starting in 47, as Colin said. Had they at least called it the People's Festival Square, yes. uh, we could probably live easier with it, you know. <laughs> but, um, uh, so it did not work out. What worked out was that uh, a statue that we still can see <coughs> in Festival Square, the African Mother and Child statue by Anne Davison, which was the first publicly funded uh, statue monument of a black woman in uh, the whole of Britain. So at least there, Edinburgh can claim, you know, to have something, uh, a first that they, that, that, that they did uh, in 1986-87. Uh, Michael Kelly, who drove that campaign for Mandela Place, uh, the provost uh, of, of uh, the Glasgow Council, said, uh, uh, in hindsight, you know, when he reminisced about it, we were one of the first to do that in the world. Beyond Africa, Mandela wasn't practically well known then. It was controver controversial at the time and took a lot of bravery from the council. So a lot of debate over why we were doing things like renaming places after an unknown African. It was important because we helped to raise his profile and caused people to look at the man behind the stories. Uh, in, in, uh, in all these campaigns that I've just mentioned you know, about the plays in the square, um, Hamish was not at the forefront of uh, the campaigns. He was part of the Edinburgh Anti-Apartheid Committee, which existed from 1980 to, eight, to 1992, uh, but he was uh, not the convener of, of it. Uh, he was just, it was part of his portfolio, if you like, but he was not the leading light there. Glasgow 1993, we've already covered, uh, uh, but 1997 is the next important date because Mandela comes to Edinburgh. Uh, it's the head of, uh, the heads of Commonwealth Conference here and Edinburgh by then had conferred the freedom of the city to, uh, to uh, Nelson, Mandela, Nelson, Nelson Mandela. And he came, and during that there was a ceremony uh, where he received that freedom. But there was no meeting and no contact between Hamish Anderson and Nelson Mandela in 1997. Uh, there was, and you, would, you won't like this. You certainly won't like this. Uh, but of course, when the reception was, he got into speaking with... Uh, Daphne Slay, who was a conservative councillor, and she said, you know, I'm a conservative, and he said, mm, conservative, uh, and she thought he, he, will, he will give her something about the conservative stance on anti-apartheid and all that. No, he did not. He did not. He said, he asked about the well-being of Margaret Thatcher. <laughs> I have always had a great deal of admiration for Margaret Thatcher, for Mrs. Thatcher. I was touched by her concern for me. <laughs> um, because Margaret Thatcher had urged him apparently to conserve his energy because your country needs you when he met her in 1990 and he was really smitten by the Iron Lady uh, in, his, in, his, in his diaries and in his notes you know he says you know she's a woman of character and he was, and he was, he was, so I said hey, you won't like that but I just thought I'd throw it in and, um, another thing that I would not go into in detail now is that uh, uh, at that time, he began, uh, of course, to take a great interest in the Lockerbie um, uh, disaster and, and, uh, and Al Megrahi and the trial. Uh, he, as far back as 1992, he offered uh, South Africa as a neutral ground, neutral, neutral location for the trial. And uh, uh, he said in 1997, when he was here, he said, uh, um, No one nation should be complainant prosecutor and judge. And uh, in 2002, he actually visited Al Megrahi in uh, uh, Barlini. Uh, and he was very, very well prepared about it. Of course, uh, Mandela was very close to uh, uh, Gaddafi. And uh, he said that he had uh, assurances from Gaddafi and documents from, from Gaddafi that uh, proved or helped to prove that uh, Al Megrahi was not actually the perpetrator of the, the Lockerbie bomb. Uh, so uh, there was a, a long, long drawn out engagement from the early 90s uh, to the 2000s of uh, involvement of uh, Mandela uh, and interest in the trial that was going on. Actually, that the trial happened uh, in Camp Seist was a compromise that he was involved in negotiating. It was not South Africa, but was at least not in Scotland, although under Scots law. Um, and he uh, when he visited him in, in, in uh, 2002, uh, he said, McGrath is all alone. He has nobody he can talk to. 
It is psychological persecution that a man must say for the length of his long sentence all alone would be fair if you are transferred to a Muslim country, and there are Muslim countries which are trusted by the West. It will be it it, it will make it easier for his family to visit him, and he is in a place like the if he is in a place like the Kingdom of Morocco, Tunisia, or Egypt. In 2009, the Scottish government tried to solicit a statement from Mandela, Mandela about the release of Megrahi, uh, but he denied. He said, uh, the, or, or a letter from his office said that he was no longer involving himself in public affairs, but that the move was appreciated. That's it would go that far. Now we know Hamish died in 2002. Nelson Mandela's 95th birthday celebrations on the 18th of July this year were overshadowed by his critical health condition. He had been in hospital at that time for more than seven weeks with a severe lung infection held alive by machines. That is still the case, although his condition seems a bit more stable uh, as we gather here to celebrate him and Hamish. Nelson Mandela's birthday um, it, on 18th July um, has solicited a call for people everywhere to celebrate his birthday by acting on the idea that each person has the power to change the world. That idea of a Mandela Day was inspired by Nelson Mandela at his 90th birthday celebrations in London's Hyde Park in, the, in 2008, when he said, this is, it's time for new hands to lift the burdens. It is in your hands now. And uh, so the idea is that on Mandela Day, people would give 67 minutes representing the 67 years that uh, Mandela gave in the office uh, of the ANC uh, uh, or, and, 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 and as president of uh, a, a free South Africa and do public service. Now, I think we have spent probably Larry and I together a bit more than 67 minutes uh, of, of your time, but it was gladly spent and it's time for a few concluding remarks there. To say, as Colin did in his invitation, that uh, uh, there's a lifetime of friendship between uh, Mandela and, uh, and uh, Hamish Henderson is perhaps a slight exaggeration. Uh, the archive uh, does not show any correspondence from Mandela to, uh, uh, to, to Hamish Henderson. If they really had been bosom bodies, uh, buddies, you know, over, the, over the, all those years, there probably would have been a bit more contact uh, after 1990, particularly when it comes to Edinburgh in 1997. You know, a quick phone call at least or something like that is that is on record. Uh, there's nothing. I even was wondering, you know, I mean, I would go wondering, is Glasgow a mist or something like that? I could not find any photographic document. You know, the STV did a five minute mm. uh, reminiscence thing about Glasgow and, and Mandela. And no way you can spot Hamish. But Brian Finning said, I have got a photograph that shows me and Trevor Hodgson and uh, 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 Hamish in the same photograph in the city chambers, you know, when I introduced them. So that at least is not a myth, you know, and although they probably were not friends in that sense that, you know, um, if you plow through all the books of um, Nelson Mandela and many of the books that have been written about him, you will not find a mention of Hamish Henderson. Um, so again, you know, if it was a real deep friendship, you would think that uh, he would, uh, you know, devote at least a few lines to, to Hamish, to Rivonia, or to something. But I think we have to see the two different perspectives. For Hamish, um, for, for Nelson Mandela, the, the fight against apartheid was his life, and has been his life, you know. All, I mean, all his life, that was the focus. And he registered the solidarity that he got from around the world, and part of that solidarity was Hamish Henderson, and was the song Rivonia, and was the anti-apartheid movement in Britain or in Scotland but also in America, also in other countries. So I, I, I don't think, you know, he probably just didn't want to single out uh, sort of uh, single persons there. For, for him, this was the bigger picture. And for Hamish, uh, the campaign against apartheid was part of his portfolio. Um, and um, uh, that, you know, uh, in, in included all kinds of campaigns that Hamish has pursued and has been part of. Uh, during his lifetime, whether that be anti-Polaris, anti-nuclear, the anti-nuclear movement, whether it be home rule, whether it be anti-poll tax, whether it be the fight for the School of Scottish Studies, he actually sent a letter to Winnie Mandela in the late 80s, uh, soliciting or trying to solicit a story for a journal that I think was never published, but in support of the School of Scottish Studies when it was threatened by Thatcherite cuts. Um, 
So it was his political activism, his uh, campaign uh, for gay rights, for instance, his uh, uh, campaign was mentioned, uh, uh, Salvador Allende, uh, 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 the, the Chile Solidarity Committee that it was part of. You know, all these, these campaigns you know, uh, played a role in Hamish Henderson's life, but a constant certainly was uh, the, uh, the fight uh, against apartheid. Hamish loved the song Say Will We Yet by Walter Watson from 1854. It was sung by the Corries and was made famous by Tony Cough.